<laughs> All right, so let's get started. So uh, hi and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Pete Sacco. I am the president and founder of a company in Oakland, New Jersey. I'd like to refer to it as the Lesser Oakland. We are uh, um, basically builders of data centers. And uh, so there's two divisions of PTS, people who design and build data center facilities, and then the managed IT and managing and some, whether it's managed IT on-prem or uh, co-location facilities. And I have some um, um, guests with me, so that I've, some that I've known for a long time and some that I've recently made acquaintance, but uh, the, they're really expertise is in cybersecurity. And so um, I want to introduce first uh, Yasser Ali. And Yasser, uh, why don't you give an introduction to yourself and what uh, Polymer is all about and uh, take it away. Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Pete. Uh, uh, nice meeting you, everyone. Uh, Yasser Ali, founder of Polymer. Uh, we are data governance uh, slash data privacy, uh, or as we like to call it, data loss prevention product for the cloud, uh, specifically cloud-hosted applications, where as companies are moving more and more to the cloud, what, what we're seeing on the news right now is more ransomware, more attacks, uh, more exfiltration information, and uh, no control over employee um, actions in terms of how easy it is to remove data from uh, hypothetical on-prem company accounts to um, external um, areas. And, and our tool basically protects uh, some of those things happening with a machine-enabled uh, uh, fully automated solution. Great, thanks Yasser. John, <laughs> why don't you take it away? Sure. Uh, John Gomez, I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Sensato Cybersecurity Solutions. Um, we're a um, what we would call a full stack cybersecurity firm, meaning we provide a software uh, platform. Uh, on top of that, we have a 24 by 7 cybersecurity tactical operations center. And we also have a library of, of widgets that we include. The other side of our business, we work very much in doing uh, risk assessments, penetration, tenting, incident response and uh, tabletop simulations and threat hunting. Uh, on my own, uh, outside my activities with Sensato, um, uh, involved in the development of cyber munitions and cyber warfare. Um, so yeah, that's me, that's Sensato. So thank you for having us. Yeah, my pleasure. So again, Pete Sacco, I'm going to serve as the moderator here, uh, you know, being the least smart guy in the room. And so uh, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions of these guys. And so just to be uh, uh, fair, John and I have known each other for quite a while now. In fact, we work pretty closely together. Uh, John's company, uh, Sensato, um, is very abled in the in the especially the uh, healthcare and medical and hospital industries, and and PTS has a partnership with them. We're in the small and medium sized businesses where my managed IT lives. We really offer two levels of managed IT: one at the device level, and one more in the posturing. And and you know, I'm sure we're going to learn more about Nightingale um, and John's uh, uh, capabilities around there. Um, so first, I want to, you know, thank everybody for attending today, because, uh, you know, as we all know, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So that's why we decided to uh, put this together now. And really, I'm going to divide up what we're going to talk about today into the three areas that I believe um, are uh, of cybersecurity. First, I want to have ask some questions around ransomware specifically, and what is the clear and present risk that is going on today? talk about some of the magnitudes of losses and common methods of attack that we've been seeing um, that are going on. I then want to migrate to uh, talk about how do we protect ourselves. And so series of questions around uh, people, technology, and perhaps operations. Um, we'll uh, round the corner and to do, how do you, what do you do if you are attacked? How do you, um, you know, what could you do to prepare yourself for running playbooks and Samuel simulations? And then we'll finish up with some next steps, and next steps, and we'll talk about some of the assessments that uh, we all offer um, to help you. And so, you know, first, I just want to talk about some of the um, clear and present risks that are out there right now. So, John, we'll start with you. What are some of the trends that we're seeing in cybersecurity, specifically ransomware, going on right now? And has it changed in the last day, week, month, year? So uh, yeah, so ransomware is continually evolving and, and obviously a, a clear and present danger in terms of what we see. And in regards to evolution of ransomware, um, we have seen not just uh, the tactics evolve, but also the technology to some extent, <clears throat> but more so the tactics. And what I mean by that is traditionally ransomware uh, was something that you, you know, went after, you targeted an end user, you sent them an email, you did something, they clicked on something and then you launched the attack. 
we still see that, and, and a majority of the attacks do do that. But we also now are seeing where the attackers um, are really sending an email or sending something or breaking into the server infrastructure, and then they're kind of being patient. So you click on something, the attack doesn't actually take place immediately. Uh, they get into the network, they catalog your assets, they figure out what you have on the network. Uh, they typically will steal some data. I'll tell you a little funny story about that. Well, not so funny for who it happened to, but maybe funny for us. Um, and so they're taking their time to learn what you have. And part of that is they're beginning to use what we call exploitation tactics. Uh, what I mean by that is this, they, they comb through your data um, and they launch the ransomware attack at some point in the future. When that attack launches, if you don't pay the ransom, um, for example, we work as Peter mentioned in hospitals a lot, um, they will call patients um, or they will call the employees and they will say something to the extent of, you know, if it's an employee, hey, do you have a, a son or daughter that goes to so-and-so school? And they know this because they'll track you on social media. And at that point, what they'll do is they'll tell you if you want to see your daughter or son again, you should tell your employer to pay the ransom that was just launched against your organization. So they're really getting very much into exploit. Uh, the quick funny story I'll tell you is um, we did have a situation where uh, an organization got hit by ransomware. They tried to negotiate with the attackers, which is something we do recommend in terms of the price of the ransom. And the attacker said, no, we're not negotiating. We know you can afford the $1.7 million ransom that they had asked for. Uh, and the way we know that is because we have a copy of your cyber liability insurance policy. And then they sent an image of the cyber liability insurance policy uh, binder page, the cover page, and showed that you're insured for 1.7 million against ransomware. So the tactics are definitely changing. Uh, it's not what it was even six months, eight months ago. They're becoming much, much more creative and effective of what they do. So. Yeah, John and I, you both always said, right? The bad guys have the always responding to what we, throw up as an obstacle and they're always seem to be one step ahead of, of, of increasing their capabilities um, to do it. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get to later on though, but uh, the truth of the matter is lack of sophistication is still by far the number one way that people are getting in. So to that end, um, Yasser, you tend to be on more of the cloud centric side of, of, of cybersecurity and protection. And so what I would like from your perspective is, you know, I could tell you from me as a data center builder, one common thread across small and medium sized businesses is, is that we want to be all in the cloud. And uh, what the reality is they're saying across large and medium sized businesses, they're saying, I want to be hybrid. What we're starting to see evolve now is um, edge deployments wherever I have people, technology and or process large data warehouses that are either large data centers or co-location and then cloud enablement cloud where necessary. So my first question, with cloud storage, how do you lock it down? How do you make uh, to protect the cloud? And, and do we can we even do the same sorts of things with cloud-based data that we're doing with what John alluded to of protecting servers? Yeah, no, so like going back about uh, 11 years ago when AWS first started, you saw um, uh, cloud infrastructure pieces like a server on demand or databases on demand. Those are the basic building blocks. And over the, over the course of the last 10 years, uh, companies like uh, Snowflake and other type of databases have kind of come online and providing kind of all-in-one solution wrapped up with security, bringing your own keys and things like that. So uh, the reason to give this like two second history is because what I've noticed, uh, you know, I, I ran a consulting business for like 10 years uh, around a lot of these installations. Uh, what we found was a lot of organizations uh, did not have the expertise um, in terms of managing some of these cloud assets. And they used to bring in consultants and, okay, let's move to uh, Amazon and let's move some of our old files into S3 buckets and then store them there. And that'll be a first point. And, and kind of uh, not realizing some of the controls around uh, proxies or IAM policies were just uh, blatantly incorrect or were modified incorrectly or were not being maintained properly with, with employees leaving uh, or coming in or with your partners. And so what that kind of has, we've seen the effect of that obviously with a lot of these assets kind of uh, being very vulnerable. And that has obviously uh, uh, given cloud a bad name in terms of uh, where things stand right now. And now we've seen in the last few years where companies basically are saying, okay, we don't want any of that. Let's go to my Azure cloud because that's secure and, and, and we're going to, 
rent the space, not necessarily own it ourselves. So we'll pay a little extra premium and just go with the vendor like Oracle or um, Snowflake or, or Amazon or, or even GCP, I guess. And you know, so we have, we're seeing that switch, except what's, what's happening with that is um, the expense is going up. Uh, employees, you still cannot hire fast enough, especially in, in legacy uh, businesses. It's, it's very hard to attract talent, which is cloud native uh, or, or cloud uh, proficient. Uh, so you have to kind of retool the skill set, which is frankly never done properly or, or, or done very successfully, not as commonly as, as, as can be. Um, yeah. And that is kind of uh, uh, creating this, uh, this need uh, where we see in the marketplace is a lot of companies are now kind of moving their workloads over to hosted applications. So that's where it's kind of SaaS comes in. Like, okay, let's move everything to GitHub, uh, our code bases or ticketing system. We're not going to maintain our service now in install, which is on-prem. We're going to kind of do it on the hosted side uh, or we're going to do a Google workspace and kind of do our email, storage, chats, everything in one place. So, which is gives a, uh, which in some way gives you some amount of safety. But what we are seeing now, the the derivative effect of that downstream, which is happening, is um, even that is uh, causing uh, or, or showing uh, cracks in terms of uh, holes which are opening up in those environments. Uh, in terms of um, uh, people sharing files in Google Drive with links which are public, uh, not locking those files down uh, with external parties or they have code bases which have uh, secret keys just sitting out there and those code bases are being checked in or being merged in with public repositories or repositories which are kind of opened up uh, by mistake or, or whatever not. And they're not controls or kind of uh, being able to even have a handle if someone is doing something wrong. Uh, yeah. So in a, just start, start, starting, starting like kind of stepping back for one second and what this the old paradigm of technology used to be IAM policies where a uh, firewall was the, was the holy grail uh, and everything under the yeah. firewall, uh, as long as you have access to a given application, given folder, you're good to go and do whatever you want to do. In the SaaS world is kind of where organizations are still thinking about IAM policies and permissioning of access. Except in SaaS land, uh, the, the way the work happens is around collaboration and you need more people on the platform and start using these platforms for work to be effective uh, on the in the cloud there. And that's kind of where IAM policies in general uh, need to rethink and and, uh, and the security posture arising from that is uh, something which is still uh, in, in infancy uh, as an internal kind of skill set for most organizations. Yeah, I mean, so as a wrap up, we, we have both now cloud and on-prem technologies. So we've actually made it more complex to protect our stealth. We need actually different knowledge sets to be able to protect each side. Just out of curiosity, from your perspective, have you seen the number of clients that are paying the ransom increase or decrease? Um, you know, or let me, let me phrase it a differently. How many people are able to protect themselves from a ransomware versus not protect themselves? And then once they're caught, how many people recover off of the ransomware without paying the, the, you know, the fine and how many people there? Just general, I know we can't share particulars, but where do we see the trends of that? Yeah, John, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I can tell you from our perspective, and we do get involved in a lot in ransomware response, but <clears throat> I would say of the cases we know of and, and, and work with directly, um, probably about 95% of people pay the ransom. Um, you know, there's a small subset that do not, but you're in for a long road. Uh, another thing to know is that a ransomware attack, typically you measure recovery in, in terms of months. So if you're hit and you don't pay, you're challenged, you're probably going to be out of out of service for, for several months right. uh, without access to your systems. Uh, today's actually, you know, kind of a hallmark day. And, and I, I, I didn't know if I was going to bring this up or not, but I will. And then maybe some of you have already seen this, but yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article that, um, at least here in the United States, the first death uh, of, a, of a person attributed to a ransomware attack had occurred. Uh, and that is a, a baby that was uh, unfortunately died in Spring Hill Hospital. Um, uh, several months ago, there was a ransomware attack. Uh, because of the ransomware attack, they couldn't um, provide adequate care for this child and the child died. Uh, so it wasn't a direct attack against a medical device. It just was an attack against the entire hospital. So there are really, really serious consequences. But you know, we see most people do pay the ransom. 
Uh, and the ransom numbers are also increased. The amount of ransom is, is really high. Uh, you know, you're talking typically six figures and higher um, in terms of paying that. Um, so. And then the added uh, kind of like, and uh, I think John can add to this some more, is like, uh, we'll talk about this later, but the knock-on effect is you get hacked once or have a ransomware once, you try to go and get your cyber insurance policy renewed for the next year, you're basically capped out. Maybe you can do it one more time. If it happens again, you're completely capped out. So the control or the mitigating factor around cyber insurance, uh, which is a corollary to all this is, something which, uh, which companies cannot even count on uh, as such, especially where it's a multi-million dollar policy, um, the amount of uh, uh, the on onus on the customer or, or, or the medical uh, provider uh, is becoming higher and higher where even if you try to go claim your uh, policy amount, uh, there's so many uh, clauses in there in terms of what are the controls, have you taken care of all the controls which are in the best of your judgment, which is a legal kind of term in many cases, is what does that even mean? And, and that is being contested pretty heavily in the court. So um, this is something which, uh, you, know, you know, most companies, if they're not, should be like having like some sort of uh, a fund on the side, uh, which needs to kind of get capped out as an insurance policy uh, just to pay some of these things. Yeah, I want to stay on time. So that's a perfect segue right there, right? Because, all right, I think we've scared everybody, right? We know it's a clear and present danger in the in the community right now. It's getting more complex to do it, not less complex. The stakes are being raised. Insurance, uh, uh, you know, uh, insurance uh, is only going to carry you so far. You're going to have to posture yourself to prevent these more and more. So how do I protect uh, myself, if I am a, you know, if I am a company today, and I really want to start with the the technology side, because John, when you and I met, that was the first thing I noticed. For the beauty of the world we live in today, is you could be a small business with a great idea, and I don't think ever before in history can you um, build a great idea into a great company and a great product. So I want to focus on the technology thing first. So, um, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit about how Sensato postures itself to help protect its clients and what, what have you developed uh, to do that? So how's that for a, a tee up? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a variety of things we do. I mean, we, we have what's known as a full stack solution. I know that sounds kind of uh, ominous or maybe a little gray, uh, but what that simply means is we, we come in and we provide our own software, which is known as Sensato Nightingale. And that's composed of three modules, a compliance module, a detection module and a response module. I won't go into each one of those, but it is fully integrated. And the real idea there is that most organizations invest and spend a lot of time deploying cybersecurity solutions, whether it's a small company or a very large multinational organization, but they never really get it fully deployed. They don't have the resources, they don't have the techniques or the, the, the talent and for a variety of reasons. So we've really tried to focus on how do we get an organization up with a fully integrated security platform in a very short amount of time. And so for us, we can have most organizations up and running in, in a matter of days. Uh, on top of that, we include 24 by seven monitoring. We built a security operations center uh, that is manned 24 seven. It's a very specialized security operations center since we work with hospitals and, and other critical infrastructure agencies. We work a lot on how do we uh, deal with very serious attacks. Uh, and then on top of that, we've created a library that we call widgets which are basically 50 templates or so that are policies and procedures that organizations can customize so that they have the right policies and procedures in place. And that's what we mean by full stack. And so we're able to deploy that and then we're able to integrate um, with other areas such as uh, cloud security providers and, and uh, data protection uh, providers. So we don't do it all, but we do create that backbone, that framework that then you, once you have that up and running, you have the ability to detect attacks, respond to attacks, reduce liability, increase defensibility, so that's kind of in a nutshell how, how we go about uh, supporting people. That's great. And Yasser, how about by, from your perspective, from that cloud perspective, what technologies and tools uh, you know, do you use uh, to help protect your clients? Yeah, our focus really is uh, as companies uh, move uh, more and more to cloud hosted applications, third party applications. Uh, I'm talking when you're uh, using Zoom and you have a large group of people, you're sharing files within Zoom in a company. Uh, you are in Google Drive uh, or Gmail, you're sending stuff externally, getting a bunch of incoming emails, uh, which are related to HIPAA data necessarily. 
uh, or you could be using a chat platform like Teams or Slack or other uh, such uh, hosted uh, systems or Zendesk or Jira or whatever. Uh, so essentially, uh, our, our solution is, is what's called a virtual compliance officer, which is essentially an automated way of uh, uh, looking at sensitive data traffic and be able to remove it in real time if it's at risk. So um, if there are, uh, uh, you can design policies around like if someone is sharing a sensitive file externally, I want those public links to expire within 24 hours, for example, within Google Drive, any of your employees mm -hmm. does that. Um, if there's some file shared in your chat platform, um, a file can remain intact, but anything within the file having sensitive data can be zapped out um, so there's a lot of uh, automations that built in to be able to, uh, without creating operational overhead, be able to reduce some of the risk associated with having surface area of sensitive data over these platforms, uh, which could be sitting in people's homes, living rooms, or unprotected Wi-Fi, or even within company uh, premises. I think automation is going to have to be the key, right? Because we're all being forced to do more with less. And unless we're able to build automation into all these platforms that we trust the technologies that we're deploying to keep us safer, um, long gone is the day where I could fill a room full of people in order to uh, protect ourselves. So with that, let's talk about people and training. And, and so, John, what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes companies are making today um, in prepping to you know, com combat a, a a ransomware attempt, and you know what can what can we do differently? Yes, yeah, so I, I so a couple of weeks ago, um, we saw a report from the New Zealand Cybersecurity Center, which is their national incident response center. And they put out a report, which I, I read through it about ransomware specifically. And one of the things that caught me my eye in that report is that eighty seven percent of all ransomware attacks that they studied over the last five years use very basic, basic attack methodologies. These aren't things that attackers are doing like the, the James Bond minority report, Mr. Robot kind of stuff. They're really basic attacks, but they get in and they're effective. And I think so that kind of talks to one of the most, I would say there's two important things you need to do. One based on that data is you got to go defend against the basics. You got to patch your servers. You've got to you know, address vulnerabilities that you detect, assuming you're doing vulnerability scans, and hopefully you are, you've got to protect and lock down your perimeter. You've got to get rid of old software. You know, these are the things that allow attackers to, to be successful. Um, you know, actually working with organizations like PTS, this is where there's value to get an organization in that can help you lock down your environment and manage the environment. But that's really kind of the most important investment you can make is get your environment, whether it's on-prem or, or cloud, locked down um, and, 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 and uh, you know, clean it up. And the second thing is really educating your end users and, and getting them to understand what does a ransomware attack look like? Uh, how does it actually happen? How do you contribute to the attack taking place? Um, I think that's a, those, those are my two big kind of preachy moments, if you will. Yeah. And, and um, yep. So uh, Yasser, how, how about you? How do you, um, when you're when you're training people and you're implementing this and you're doing this with people, how do you measure the success? You know, uh, how do you measure the success of how well you're building security processes and and your involvement of your people in these? Yeah, I mean, there are some statistics we like to quote is like like as little as seven percent of your employee base is responsible for like eighty seven or eighty plus percent of risk associated with people just doing stupid stuff. Security is a people problem first, technology problem second, as we know. Uh, most of these attacks are happening because of people either accidentally doing things or just being sloppy about, or just being pure stupid about things. Um, so this, this has been a perennial thing, not just from the product days where I sit right now, but even from my prior days uh, in consulting, where the measurement of uh, security uh, training uh, and how much of it is being actually going inside is 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 a, is sort of like a black hole which has been which has been there. So we have uh, I mean discussed with the various companies uh, that come to mind uh, in the security training space, um, uh, such as Hook Security is one. Is, it's a small startup, but what they're like, for example, uh, not to pitch them in or anything, but the approach they've taken is like uh, they've done funny videos or, or things which can stick or resonate with you uh, and be able to then deploy those videos um, when someone does something wrong. So we have been trying to think of some um, uh, some of those ideas in terms of behavioral uh, techniques because um, 
for us, from our vantage point, since we connect into applications where the usage is pretty high and we can catch uh, people sharing files externally or, uh, or, or keeping sensitive data at risk, um, how do you kind of like nudge them at the time when the thing happens? And, and we've seen effects of that reduce the amount of um, repeat patterns by the same individual, at least uh, by uh, tremendous uh, large amounts if you do it right when they do something wrong. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. Uh, uh, security training, unfortunately, has not kept up with the times. It's still a quarterly exercise where you do a check off and move on. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, John said it right. Like, the, it's just very simple. The simple stuff first. Like, that is uh, yeah. something people forget, uh, changing password, MFA, um, just the basic stuff. Yeah, people indeed, right? Just think how easy IT and cybersecurity, if we had to take, if we could take people out of the equation, right? But, you know, John, it was interesting when we're deploying Sensato and we're doing um, the honeypots, you know, I remember learning from you early on that it was as important to put them on the inside of the network as outside of the network, right? Because of uh, a lot of the attacks coming from within, we keep reading in newspapers, right? That the latest great cyber breach is usually from some disgruntled employee who just knows the right place, the most, the biggest vulnerability. Can you talk a little bit more about from the operational standpoint of, of deploying that, you know, you had the talk last week with Hector and, you know, a guy came from the black hat side of hacking and, and you know, honeypots was the one thing um, that that kind of scares them. So why don't you talk about a little bit? I think that's important for people to understand what that means from both the external side of the network and the internal side of the network. Yeah, and so for those of you that don't know um, about the, the talk that uh, Peter is uh, referencing, Hector Monsegur uh, was one of the founders of LulzSec and Anonymous. So he's, he's a pretty famous hacker, attacker. He uh, um, has, has quite a reputation in terms of his ability to break into systems. Uh, if you want to see that video, just let us know, let Peter know and, and or others, and we'll, uh, we'll get you a link to that. But, you know, we talked to Hector about what scares you. You know, you get into a network, what is that security solution or tool that scares you? And um, his response was basically honeypots, right? Because they don't really do anything except set off an alert. They're not trying to analyze you. It's like a mousetrap, right? If you touch them, they're going to go off. Um, you know, we offer honeypots with our solution, so we're obviously a little biased, but they are a great tool to detect zero days, um, to detect movement in your network, whether it be from an insider threat um, or a, um, an out external threat, but deploying them inside your network is a, is a really great tactic um, just because they do give you this kind of last line of defense capability. And not only that, but the automation is key, right? The idea of now being able to look at those and and, and, and correlate um, the mm -hmm. tremendous amounts of data that flows through your, uh, that you monitor on a daily basis to see who's hitting what ports, how many times and why, and being able to make those automated inferences today, as opposed to years ago when you kind of had to visually see it and, and kind of recognize that there's something nefarious going on. And today you have launched a, a wide array of tools to be able to, to do that and then start backtracing usually to usually to an instigator that we can't do anything about, but at the very least, at least we know um, that we're protecting ourselves and we sit and we chase them down a rabbit hole. How about one, you, Yasser? One thing I, yeah, one thing I'll add there, like we, you know, big fan of uh, honeypots and, and what John is doing is like pretty, pretty remarkable uh, uh, in that space also. So we've uh, taken the playbook around uh, some of the more insider threat uh, perspective where uh, putting in the concept of honeypots into, into SaaS platforms, so for example, code repos with files having uh, patient data labels or, or other stuff in there where uh, with appropriate training, no one on the inside should be touching it or people only trying to get into it uh, are doing it for the wrong reasons. And we've, we've kind of uh, been experimenting with this stuff within Google Drive and other SaaS infrastructures in terms of how do we uh, replicate that uh, Honeypot concept into something which is more user-driven. Um, um, Still yet to be seen what the progress is going to be, but definitely uh, having these uh, booby traps uh, across the enterprise, not just from the cloud infrastructure or infrastructure perspective, but also within the uh, third-party apps themselves uh, is, is what we're trying to marry uh, together. Yeah. 
Great. So I, I want to shift gears yet again, and I want to start talk about now help people understand what do you do if you're attacked. And so I'll start with a, a little story. So I was CEO of an organization. I'm not going to mention where, and it was many years ago, and it was my first experience of having uh, your entire network crippled through a ransomware attack. Luckily, um, we had a pretty able team, and uh, it was back in the day when you could recover off of backups, right? Remember when we used to be able to recover off of backups and actually get in, you know, and it still took us all day to get back up and running, um, but we were able to get back up and running. And it was something as benign as somebody just do, clicking on the wrong link in a, in a wrong place. And so, and I remember, John, you and I one time were sitting down and we were talking and we're like, uh, you know, how readily available is ransomware today? And, and I think we just went Googled it, you know, and, and we found like ransomware for hire within five seconds of being able people that we can hire from anywhere and do that. So let's just, John, from your perspective, for the guy, gal, who's standing there and realize that they've just been attacked, what should they do first? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing is disconnect or get disconnected from the rest of your network, assuming it's something on your laptop or desktop. It, it, ultimately, the bottom line is you want to contain the attack, right? That's your first thing is stop it from continuing the spread. The faster you can do that, the better. We actually work off of a model uh, where we try to, um, when we're training people to do incident response and we're working through incident response, um, we try to teach people that you have 14 minutes or less to respond to a serious attack. And so we, we, we work on that premise. So the first thing is contain the attack. Um, and, and yeah, that, that would be the first thing I would tell someone. Yeah, I could tell you that when we had that attack, you know, the thousands of files that we had, I think we were able to contain it down to the first 127 that were encrypted. And even that 127 before we basically detached from the network and, uh, uh, and, and stopped the spread of the virus, uh, we were... <laughs> It still took all day just to recover files off of there and forget about disaster, you know, DR and the backups and rollbacks to point in time. And right, it was just that was a nightmare just getting back operational off of that. But I agree 100 percent. Stop the attack as soon as possible. How about your perspective on that, Yasser? What do you think? You know, and what we're basically talking about is building that playbook. You know, what's your you know, what's your take on uh, what happens first when your customer is attacked and, and, and building a playbook for that? I mean, from our perspective, we obviously are not in the front line as much as obviously John is uh, from the infrastructure perspective. But uh, for us, uh, we're looking at the physical assets themselves, like the actual customer files, copies of invoices, uh, bank buyer information, um, healthcare records, which are recorded in images or, or stored in large object stores, for example, S3 buckets and stuff. So for us, we, we always, uh, you know, recommend uh, kind of... Uh, um, you know, already removed uh, up front uh, the, the last radius, so to speak, uh, by uh, reducing the amount of uh, people having access to that in general, like only the CTO has access or it requires uh, two different authentications, uh, two different mobile phones uh, before you can even get into a, 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 a service or, or a folder. So it's, uh, it, those are obviously uh, window dressings in the in the scheme of things when the whole infrastructure is kind of going down. Uh, but uh, we feel that at the minimum, uh, these are records which are, if exposed externally, uh, can leave a bad mark uh, in terms of the, the fines that you might be responsible for. Uh, if a social security number has a cost of, let's say, uh, we're just talking to someone today on, the, on, on some of the cost estimates for cyber insurance and, uh, you know, a social security number will cost you from a regulatory perspective, $137, let's say give or take. Uh, and let's say if you have a whole image, uh, patient data file image, uh, which was stored on a SaaS platform, which, which is leaked or SharePoint environment, let's say, what would that cost be uh, in terms of what that fine would be or the de reputation damage? Uh, so that's the kind of, uh, uh, you know, when we kind of engage with our customer, those are the uh, uh, perspectives we bring in to the table in terms of how, like, if you have those kind of files, encrypt them and, and having the key, which is rotating, um, not just one single encryption key, you have a CSEC, which rotates, so AWS KMS, uh, rotating key policy uh, over time, and, uh, or if you're using some uh, platforms like HashiCorp. So, um, you know, that, that's all, all I can say. Great, and so in keeping with the idea of uh, what do you do when you're attacked, 
um, I'm going to share a, another uh, personal story. Now, John, I know that you come from a um, law enforcement background as well. And my son, as you know, is a police officer. And uh, dare I say, it comes down to practice. And I swear to God, there's a point to this story. I remember when he became a police officer, I was amazed at how little live gunfire training there was to become a police officer. And as you know, we're both avid shooters come from having put thousands of rounds into thousands of targets. And we're both pretty good at it today and in a triage situation. Dare I say, he's probably better at it today because he's now gotten the training in and outside the you know force thanks to it. But it comes down to simulated training. It comes down to practice. And so most people are usually not prepared because they haven't practiced being prepared. So let's talk about that for a second. Give me an I, you know, build me a story around when you're doing a simulation for a client, uh, John, what does it look like for a client to run through that simulation and, uh, and how to practice the response? Yeah, I mean, so when we do tabletop simulations, we typically will take somebody through, um, you know, a scenario that's specific to them, right? What, what, is, what is important in their environment to preserve? We try to understand the tipping points and where is it that things start to break down? And then from that, you're able to make adjustments to your incident response plan and put that together. We've done things where we've, you know, defaced somebody's website. We'll, we'll take a copy of their website and we'll assume attackers got to it and we'll really make it a very bad look, right, for that organization. And suddenly now you have to deal with that, that branding problem or that confidence problem from your customers or internal attacks, right? We can replicate those and simulate them and walk through what would you do and, you know, where, again, where that tipping point is. Uh, one thing I think Yasir was making the point, and I think this is really important, and even this on tabletop simulations, you know, and Peter, when you ask me, like, what do you do if there's a ransomware attack? I think the most important thing to keep in mind is incident response starts before the attack, right? Putting in place things like the, the security practices that your seer was talking about, putting in place tabletop simulations and practicing. That's really kind of what you need to think about, right? Is, is you're preparing for the attack. So when if it, it does happen, you're able to respond and you have the right technologies in place. Um, versus just all of a sudden hoping for the best and, and, and seeing what happens from there. Yeah, 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 sir, are you, do you often advise clients and help build those simulations and preparing the teams to verify, um, you know, un, unwanted intrusions and things like that? What is your role in uh, that preparedness, if you will? Yeah, no, uh, we don't. Thank God. I don't have the stomach for it, to be honest. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm an old Wall Street guy. Uh, our focus really is around locking down uh, PHI data, where especially for organizations who don't realize where it is. It's it's quite uh, uh, funny. We have we you know we we do these assessments, for example, around like different platforms, and the common answer is no, we don't have any sensitive data on our chat platform or on our ticketing system, or no, no one is sending files. Everyone is trained to send it through secure mail, for example, um, externally. So. It's not just you; it's your partners or, or the partners' partners. So there's a compounding effect of the data which you are responsible for from your patients, from your customers, uh, from your transactions. Um, and and what does that posture look like? So we we do train in terms of um, training. Well, we we put in place technologies to be able to make sure that uh, those things can be locked down as they happen. Um, because if someone is, what we notice is if a individual, an employee is sloppy around sharing uh, patient data internally with someone on a public forum, let's say, uh, or a ticket or, or a Jira ticket or through a chat platform, that probably is the same person who's not changing his password on a monthly basis or doing it to MFA or has the last pass closed out, for example, locked out of the computer. And if you're not enforcing those things actively within your environment, this is your weak link. This is the, the weak link where uh, uh, threat actors get in from normally and, and, and create chaos. So um, it's, as John said, like it's a, it's a 360 type uh, uh, kind of work where uh, you are basically the tools which your employees are using um, is the governance around them and, and what are the controls you have to be able to monitor and be able to remove those risks um, as much as possible uh, without incurring too much operational overhead. 
That, that's perfect. And you've all day long, uh, you've given me the next exact roadmap of to where I wanted to go because <laughs> I wanted to talk about next steps now, right? And assessing your own maturity level. Uh, but I, I, before I do that, I, I, you know, you made me think of something, John, many years ago when we met, I remember you telling me a story that, um, you know, in your storied career, was, you were sitting in uh, a cybersecurity conference with the likes of all the three letter people, the CIA and the NSA and New York Cyber Sec Command and New Jersey Cyber Command. And it was probably maybe one of the first early times that you were ever in with that level of cybersecurity knowledge. And, uh, and you were amazed that the conversation came down to password changes and basically, and it was that realization that people want to think this is a far more sophisticated attack profile than actually it is. And how simply with a basic level of knowledge and a basic level of process and a basic level of training, they could present, they could prevent and be prepared for perhaps as high as 90% of the attacks that are out there in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. Because do we all, do you agree that the vast majority of the people attacking are opportunists and not uh, you know, they're opportunists and not necessarily malicious trying to take down the world. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, there, you know, another way to look at it, we have a term for most attackers, right? 90% of attackers are what we call script kiddies, right? They're just have a basic, they take somebody else's code, they watch YouTube, whatever they're doing, they're not, you know, when we think of like NSA level attacks or going after, you know, nuclear power plants and shutting down the grid, you know, that's the 10%. And they are real and they're very serious. And yes, there are nation state attackers, but for the most part, again, we keep going back to this theme, the attacks aren't that sophisticated and the talent levels aren't that sophisticated. They just find the opportunity. Here's something all of you can do that are watching this. Uh, Google the word Shodan, S-H-O-D-A-N. Um, actually, I'll tell you what, Peter, if you wanna go onto USR, I'll try to bring this up on my screen and I can share it and we'll just see. We'll Great. do something really simple. Great. While we're doing, while John's working on that, I want to uh, share another story. I, you, we saw a distinct, you know, the, the federal government has stayed out of helping enterprises with respect to ransomware and attacks right up until we saw the pipeline be attacked. Would you, you know, uh, we saw a distinct change in the posture of the federal government of how it's treating nation state attacks and even, uh, you know, organized attacks. And so I think that's a good thing, um, you know, uh, but uh, while it, Yasser, let, talk to me about, um, you know, what uh, your perspective is on um, how you assess the maturity level of, uh, you know, a client um, and, and as to how you assess what you can do to help them as a, as a next step. Yeah, no, this is uh, just coming from customers who are far more intelligent and have seen more like CISOs I work with. And some of, some of the simplest things are having everyone having a, uh, 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 a last pass or, or a password, uh, uh, password integrator. protection program password yep. protection program on everyone's employees' uh, desktops. Uh, there are very easy ways of administrating them that if someone's desktop last pass or password protection program is not work, uh, is not on or switched on, they can be like literally they cannot work until they switch it back on and reset their password and be applying policies where everyone needs to change their password every month, every two weeks. Um, and, and have encrypted password. That's like the most basic thing. Uh, yeah. And then obviously, you know, in terms of uh, two factor for as, as many applications as you can get into, uh, unfortunately, a lot of homemade applications or legacy applications, you don't have that option, but uh, the VPN, uh, which you connect into or some of the other environments, which you, which you use to have your employees connect into your internal environment, that needs to be having password kind of changes or, or IP based protection where uh, if someone is sitting in, in Bermuda, they need to tell you they're in Bermuda, otherwise they will be locked out. So geographic uh, kind of limitations of who can access your environment. I mean, those are very basic and very easy and right. cheap uh, solutions now available in the market. And it doesn't take much to kind of uh, get them going. So, I mean, for us, that's like the uno number one in terms of like kind of getting started. And obviously once you kind of get on the platforms themselves, um, there's lots of things you can do or uh, automate some of those things, uh, uh, you know, with platforms like ours or, or, or just yep. manage it yourself. Great. Before we round the corner of fishing up here, uh, you know, uh, 
I, I want to tell everybody that's in attendance, if you have any questions, use the chat, right? So go on the bottom of the screen, hit chat, put some questions in there, start framing them. Even if we don't get them, uh, you know, within the time frame here, um, uh, you know, uh, you please reach out to any one of us, uh, you know, if, if you have any questions, but, but put it in the chat, we'll try to answer some of that. But John, go ahead. Why don't you pull up uh, show then? Yeah. So anybody here, anyone, this is not some weird, you know, secret site on the dark web. This is on the regular web, right? You can go to showdan.io. Uh, you can use an account or not. It's free. And um, I'm just going to show you what this website does. It's like a Google for computer devices. It goes out and it tries to find things with a chip, a computer chip, anything that has a computer chip that's on the internet. And so when we talk about locking down the environments and doing the basics and, and really putting in place proper controls, hopefully this will help you. You can show this to your, your, your leadership and go, here's why we need to do this. If you click on explore, you'll see out here that it categorizes things. And um, you can go through and some of this stuff, uh, you know, this is live. None of us on this panel talked about doing this. So we're just taking a shot here. Uh, but you can explore for your IP address. You can put in a type of, of system, like you can type in Palo Alto or you can type in Cisco, whatever you want, and it'll find everything related to that. So let's just, if I click here, uh, I'm going to get a list of every webcam that is improperly configured, whether it's in your house or in your office or wherever it is, and is literally exposed to the internet. Uh, and I can link down and kind of try to, you know, go in and see, like, can I find any here in the U.S. or wherever it may be? Um, and then if I click on these, and I'm a little scared to click because I don't know what I'm going to get. Um, so if I go here, I can see these are the open ports. Um, it can tell me exactly what this webcam is. Now, you can actually on some of these, I don't know if this one has it you can actually go down and see the webcam. You can take control of it. I don't think we can do that on this one that I picked and I really don't wanna do that. Thank God. Actually here, um, I'll do this real quick. So here, if I click here, I can probably link to that webcam. I don't know if it'll come up or not, but in the interest of privacy, we won't do that. Here on the left side of the screen, you can see all the vulnerabilities for that webcam. Now I'm using a webcam example, but this could be a VPN server. It could be your portal, your website, um, your partner systems, whatever it is. And so this is why I think we're all on this call very passionate about get the right controls in place, get the right systems in place, because the level of sophistication the attackers need it is not that high. And with tools like this, they can find you pretty easily, whether you're a very small organization, because sometimes we hear, well, I'm so small, who would come after me? All the way up to very large corporations. I'll give you a story on a small organization kind of thing. Um, there was a, a case we worked on out of Kentucky where a small business, which was basically a, a husband and wife who were running a wedding photography business, and um, they, got, they got hit and they didn't know it. They got attacked. And, you know, obviously it's a small two-person wedding photography business in a small town in Kentucky. Why did they get hit? They got hit because a lot of their customers, unbeknownst to them, actually work for a defense contractor. And when they had their wedding pictures taken, this um, wedding photographer would put it on a website that they owned so you could come and pick the pictures you wanted for your wedding album. And when you did that, they knew a lot of people did this at lunchtime from their offices. And so when they clicked, actually malware was deployed inside the defense contractor's environment. And that then kind of led to other issues that the defense contractor had. The point of this is no matter how small or how large, there's no real, oh, attackers aren't going to come after me because of whatever reason. You're, you're probably going to be targeted at some point. So, sorry. There's no lack of devious geniuses in the world, for sure. And, and uh, that is, that's a, a story that tells it. So, look, you know, from an assessment standpoint, to assess your maturity level, and there's where I want to finish out, you know, there's really a couple different ways you could do that. There's a lot of free tools out there, right? NIST, uh, you know, has a, a, a you know, a, a, a pretty good, uh, you know, platform by which you can build a maturity level. But I think it really falls into two levels. There's really, you know, I, I know uh, my team and I, we've come out with a simple um, Excel spreadsheet based evaluation of, you know, to assess for the needs of, let's call it the small operator, uh, small business owner, just to get a basic understanding of that. But John, you and I have worked together 
on your C2M2 program. Why don't you talk a little bit about what C2M2 is, how it helps the client go through the NIST process and all of the areas that it encompasses and builds the big, uh, you know, good, better, bad uh, list of categories. So, C, yeah, so C2M2 is basically a model we took from the Department of Energy. It was originally developed to allow organizations to very quickly figure out their level of cyber maturity and uh, cybersecurity maturity. And so it looks a lot across 10 different categories and it helps you rate where you stand in one of those categories and where you need to do work. The beauty of the model is it can be done really quickly. We, we run a workshop on it. Uh, but more importantly, it's non-technical. Even though it crosswalked or it supports things like NIST 853 or NIST CSF or HIPAA, the beauty of it is you could take this, the output of the model, go into a boardroom or an executive leadership session and really get people to understand where your organization stands from a maturity perspective. And then prioritize that, develop a roadmap and an investment justification, and really speak to a language that executives understand without getting them all kind of wrapped around NIST 853 and controls and baselines and all the things that as cybersecurity professionals, we need to know, but as leaderships in most companies do not need to know or wanna know. So that's kind of what C2M2 is. We do have a, a process for it in a workshop. We'd love to, to help people with that. Uh, but that's kind of what it is. And we've had a tremendous amount of success with it because it is really a rapid way to understand where you are. Sean, how much time would, does it take a typical organization to go through that process to really uh, understand it? how much work is involved from their perspective to be able to get to the end result? We, we, we run the workshop in a period of about uh, two days, uh, give or take. Because of COVID, we now do that in chunks over about a two to three week period because we do it virtually. Um, and then once we have that done, figure, let's say that's 16 hours, um, it takes us about a week to turn around the results. So you're probably looking at about all told, maybe two to three, four weeks to get everything from start to finish. There's not a lot of prep work that organizations have to do. It's a pretty rapid model. Uh, and then we give you a, a good amount of output and guidance on what you need to prioritize and recommendations. So, yep. So uh, we're just about out of time. So, you know, with that, uh, Yasser, why don't you lead us out as do you have any closing remarks, comments, ideas, anything you want to share before we head out and, uh, and see where we go? Yeah, I mean, we run into this all the time. Uh, SOC 2 uh, or HIPAA uh, comp compatibility or being um, compliant in your assessments is not a guarantee for security. Uh, those are just subjective uh, assessments uh, based on a replay of information you provide the auditor. And uh, especially with uh, type two audit or uh, ISO 27001, with the ongoing monitoring aspect of things, uh, the controls around that, especially in the cloud era, uh, that definition is changing and we expect the, the new version of SOC whenever that's out in the next few years. We'll have this around uh, having automated controls because you just cannot monitor uh, uh, some of these things. Um, so let's not confuse some of these assessments with your security posture. I think that's the bottom line. People confuse that a lot and, and that is no longer the case. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many I've gone through that you come down to a laundry list of priorities and a laundry list of dollars. And you, you know, it makes people's head spin, but yep, I, I got it. But that's the world we live in today. And so look, gentlemen, I wanna thank you both. Uh, it, you know, I, I know I find it invaluable when I get to talk to you guys and, and, and do that. So, and for everybody else out there, um, you know, whether it's uh, learning more about uh, Sensato or Polymer or, you, you know, or, or any way we can help you, we wanna thank you for your time today. We would love to uh, talk to you in any forum or any way, shape or form. You have a lot of years of experience here um, from a cybersecurity and uh, data center perspective, dare I say. Uh, so thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Um, feel free to, uh, to reach out and we hope to see you real soon. Yasser, John, thanks very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you.